is the fourth Sunday of uh, the season of Easter is given over to thinking about Jesus, the Good Shepherd, uh, hence the title, uh, Good Shepherd Sunday, uh, and focusing on some aspect of the John 10 reading headed in our church Bibles, the Good Shepherd and his sheep. Uh, this year, the lecture recital, uh, in the lecture recital, we, we are given the first part of the reading, which really doesn't highlight Jesus the Good Shepherd at all. <laughs> we have to wait until the next verse, uh, which is outside of our reading for this morning, before we hear Jesus say those words, I am the Good Shepherd. We do, however, get to reflect upon Jesus the gate, or Jesus the door, as he declares, I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. It's perhaps a somewhat less attractive picture, isn't it, than a shepherd and sheep grazing on a hillside, but it is nonetheless an important image for us to reflect upon as we hear our gospel reading today. Uh, you will be most likely aware, unless you have been living on a desert island, that there will be a coronation later this week uh, in the grand setting that is Westminster Abbey. Um, but did you know, I didn't know this until I did some research for this morning, uh, that Westminster Abbey uh, also claims to have the oldest door in Britain said to have been constructed in the 1050s and dated in 2005 by a process known as dendrochronology. I hate you writing all this down. <laughs> the door that lies between the vestibule and the chapter house of the abbey showed that the wood used for its construction was felled sometime around 1032 AD during the reign of King Edward the Confessor. Are you impressed? Good. <laughs> we are surrounded, aren't we, by doors and gates. Um, garden gates, barrier gates, city gates, the pearly gates, uh, front doors, back doors, trap doors, being at death's door. Gates and doors signify for us the ability on the whole to be able to come and go as we please. But what does it mean for Jesus to say that he is the gate, he is the door? Well, we need to set into context our reading uh, this morning um, and uh, to see that the, uh, our reading this morning comes straight after the long account uh, of the healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9. Uh, the healing of the man born blind takes place uh, but there is anything but celebration of someone whose sight has been restored. Rather, an investigation takes place by the religious leaders who wish to know how such an event has happened and who was involved. Uh, and initially, the Pharisees are skeptical that the man was ever blind, and his parents are brought into the investigation uh, to confirm those details. Still not believing the man, uh, the interrogation ends with these words addressed to the blind man whose sight has been restored. You are steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus gets to hear that the man has been rejected and effectively banished from his community. And he seeks him out to offer him more than just physical sight, asking, do you believe in the Son of Man? Which, to which he replies, who is this? And Jesus shows himself to him, and the man who had been born blind, but now sees, declares, Lord, I believe, and worships Jesus. Jesus then goes on to declare, for judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who will see become blind to which the Pharisees want to know, 
if Jesus thinks they are blind. And Jesus replies, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And the Pharisees are shocked to the core that Jesus thought that they, they were spiritually blind. That's the context in which we hear our reading from John 10 this morning. Because if you, you know the Bible, you will know that uh, our chapter headings and chapter uh, and verse headings are a, a relatively new thing. Uh, the Bible, the scriptures were one block. So uh, John uh, 10 follows seamlessly on from John 9. And the point here is that the Pharisees who have interrogated the blind man who has been healed, are supposed to be the shepherds of Israel, those who care for, protect, and nourish the people, the flock. But what their actions show here is that they have expelled him from the community, refusing to believe that Jesus and his healing work come from God. They are more concerned with guarding their power their authority than about the well-being of the people. Jesus uses this picture of shepherd, sheep, gates, and then includes thieves and robbers to put the spotlight on the Pharisees' actions and make his point that only in him can life, and life in all of its fullness, be found. It's important for us, I think, to note that this uh, picture, this metaphor of the gate is not one of exclusion. Uh, In other words, it isn't for us to think for ourselves, uh, uh, to think of ourselves uh, as Jesus' true sheep and others as outsiders. If we go down that route, we become like the Pharisees and either throw people out or keep people out uh, just as they through the blind man out of their community. The purpose of the gate, then, is not to keep other sheep out, but to be the way in which other sheep enter into the sheepfold. Jesus will go on to say later in John 10, uh, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. In this context, Jesus is referring to non-Jews, Gentiles. And John 10 affirms that Jesus came to save Gentiles as well as Jews, an insight into the worldwide mission of Jesus to come and die for the sins of the world. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. There can sometimes be a tendency, can't there, in some circles, to restrict God's blessings to one particular group or people or section. But as the scriptures confirm, God cannot be contained. Jesus refuses to be limited by the fences that we put up. The purpose of the gate in this case, is to guard against all that threatens the well-being of the sheep, thieves and robbers, bandits and wolves. Now we know, don't we, that in the world today, as has always been the case, uh, there are what we might call thieves and robbers who will seek out and kill and destroy the flock of Jesus Christ from the outside. But we also have to make Be aware uh, that there are those that are wolves in sheep's or shepherd's clothing. For example, those leaders and preachers who proclaim a cheap grace gospel. Uh, As uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes, grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without the living incarnate Jesus Christ. And then there are those who promote a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. If only you would call such and such a number and pledge such and such an amount, you will receive God's blessing however many times over. Or that long-awaited healing 
from whatever ailment you or a loved one is facing. It's a scam, basically. It's a scam. And the sad thing is that people who are gullible enough or who are desperate enough fall for it, ultimately making the preacher or leader very wealthy indeed, but meaning those who are the most desperate are left out of pocket and still struggling. Jesus warns about all who come in his name, but whose ministry doesn't quite add up, that there's something just not quite right. The fascinating thing is that the shepherd's sheep will recognize his voice. The followers of Jesus will hear his call. I think I may have mentioned this to you before, but it's well worth a second helping. Uh, that there's an interesting and amazing phenomenon in shepherding, uh, that the sheep know the voice of their own shepherd and will not follow another shepherd who is calling the sheep. Uh, in a book called Historical Geography of the Holy Land, quoted in George Beasley Murray's commentary on John's Gospel, uh, the author G.A. Smith tells of watching shepherds in Judea, saying this, Sometimes we enjoyed our noonday rest beside one of those Judean wells in which three or four shepherds come down with their flock. The flocks mixed with each other, and we wondered how the shepherd would get his own sheep. But after the watering and the playing were over, the shepherds, one by one, went up different sides of the valley, and each called out his particular call. And the sheep of each drew out of the crowd to their own shepherd. A shepherd need do nothing more than call his sheep. And only those that are his will come to him. Jesus says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, him the shepherd of the sheep, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own by name and leads them out. Now, much has been written about just how uh, unintelligent sheep are. Um, and it's true that without a shepherd, they will not necessarily be able to find food and water, or they could easily get lost or find themselves in some kind of difficulty. But Jesus emphasizes that sheep know the voice of their shepherd. Sheep know the voice of of their shepherd. In other words, they only recognize the one who cares for them and will follow them. But they will not follow a stranger's voice and call. And what is it that the voice of Jesus offers for his sheep? What is Jesus offering to you? He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. In contrast to all of those who are only out to steal and kill and destroy the ones who take life away, it is Jesus and only Jesus who gives life and in whom true life can be found. Now, you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, well, my life is pretty sorted out. I'm quite happy with my lot. Um, you may think to yourself, I have everything that I could ever wish for. But do you have the life that Jesus offers in your life? Do you have life, a life in full abundance? The whole of John's gospel is focused on this gift of life. From the very beginning, in uh, John 1, we, where we read, in him, Jesus Christ, was life. And that life 
was the light of all people. To Jesus' declaration in John 11, where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus' prayer to the Father in John 17, he says, he prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who you have sent. And then finally, in uh, John chapter 20, uh, towards the end of John's gospel, the purpose of John's gospel, which you've heard me say uh, a number of times, but it's always good to hear it again, that the signs Jesus performed in John's gospel here are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. life or eternal life in John's gospel is not just about life after death. It is also about life that begins here and now. It's about knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom God has sent to bring this life to you. It's to know the voice of the good shepherd the one who truly cares for you and knows you intimately, knows you even better than you know yourself. It's about life in community, finding security and nourishment as part of his flock, sharing in the challenges of life and the joys and the sorrows of life as we carry one another through the good times and the bad. And it's about life that abounds and endures, yes, even beyond death itself. Because death is not the final answer. There are questions now of who is God? Who is Jesus Christ? And what must I do to believe? That must be thought about and answered for you and for me so that we may know eternal life in Jesus Christ. And all of this comes back to him, to Jesus. Jesus, who is the gate and through whom we enter into this life and only through whom we enter into this life. Life in all its fullness as we respond to that call of his voice on our lives, accepting his invitation to follow him all the days of our lives and where we will find green pasture and calm waters as the psalmist reminds us. As we close, listen again to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup 
run us over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.